Greetings, Fred in Alaska. Um, here to uh, finish out uh, Thomas's story. Um, I actually, I, I talked to him again about 20 minutes ago. Um, he he had an important message that uh, it, it, I feel is valid. I'm going to share before I get started. Uh, he wanted me to convey that uh, everyone should love their people, and, and he's not speaking tribal. Um, he, he's speaking that as well, but the people in your life that we, we all end up taking for granted. Um, every single one of us, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's people that aggravate you, but you love them. There's people that really piss you the fuck off, but you love them. Um, life is short. Love your people. Um, don't take them for granted anymore, because tomorrow's not promised. So, he wanted me to convey that. I concur. Um, the the continuation of what was going on with Thomas um, at 61 they had the incident in the Tongass 65 they had the incident in the Copper River now in 1970 um, uh, 70 71 winter uh, he was with his niece um, she lived in Caltag and she was recently widowed the year before her husband was killed in a fix, uh, fishing accident. So him loving his niece, he, he went to Caltag and um, helped her with something that was going on um, with her house or whatever. She needed, you know, a guy's help with some experience in carpentry or whatever. There, there was some issues. So he loved his niece and he went to help. Um, his niece had two kids. So... He, he had been there about a month, month and a half. Uh, it was slow going with what he was doing because of the winter conditions right off the Yukon River. Uh, brutal. It, I mean, Alaska doesn't give a fuck about you. Just keep that in mind. So he's doing these projects with her. And every, every day in the afternoon it, with the low light, he would always go off into the trees and look for signs. He was hyper vigilant. He had heard some weird noises but couldn't make much of it. Now, um, they had some kind of old snow machine. It was, it was garbage, but it was, it was a trooper. Um, he couldn't remember offhand exactly what brand. It's irrelevant. <coughs> he, uh, he fueled up and, and took this trail. And it was a dog mushing trail. And, you know, someone had laid down for years and years. So he, he took off. And if, if you look on a Google map between Shaktulik and Caltag, there's just a washboard of different mountains through there. It's it's just so beautiful. Unreal. Uh, I mean, just unreal. So he's going through there, and he would peek into these little valleys off the main trail. Just not very far, but just looking, looking for any kind of sign. And he'd been doing this for uh, damn near the whole winter. Uh, because of that one particular noise he heard, it really, it really stood out with him. And it was a garbled kind of owl hoot that was far too non-owl like to be believed to be an owl and so he went with his intuition and it was about the third valley back that he took a little peek in and it was the last one he was going to look in because he was just had enough fuel to get back with a little reserve and as he was circling back around in this little valley and coming back out he saw movement off to his left and this hairy man ran up the up the side of this little uh, mountain and, and broke off into the trees. So he immediately stopped. Um, he had a seven millimeter magnum with him. He gets off and he hikes over there and follows the tracks up. Well, he comes up onto a, this cave. It wasn't very big, but he could tell something had recently scurried in there. So he wasn't about to crawl in after it. You know, he, he was too smart for that. So he goes back down the snow machine and gets back to the to the cabin. Now this is many miles away from where his niece is and where the kids are, but he 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 has a sense of how these things move and what they do. So he gets back and for the next couple days he's he's hyper vigilant. Hey, keep those kids close to the house. You know this this kind of stuff. And so as he's as he's going through all these things without telling his niece why he was so animate about keeping those kids where they where they can be safe 
you know, she was just like, don't be so, you know, they're kids, they're going to play, don't worry about them, there's no, there's no bears, you know, this time of year, they want to play in the snow, he said, I understand that, but understand there's things out in the woods that aren't bears that don't hibernate, and so she, she asked him to elaborate, and he wouldn't, so she blew him off, like, okay, you don't want to tell me, then the kids are going to play, fair enough, you know, he, he didn't feel like, putting it out there like that he was still struggling with what he had dealt with seeing the jaw blown apart and it just just a, a multitude of things that he had been struggling with because uh, he had lost contact with that buddy after the the burn pile incident you know and so after this went on for a while um, he, he stopped making his treks out to by that cave he did it a couple more times just to see but he didn't notice anything so you know, he, he always kept it on his mind. Now, from the point he first saw this thing run up into the cave to when um, things started going ugly was at least a month and a half, two months uh, of vigilance and, you know, quasi arguing with his niece. And she was getting to the point to where she was asking him to think about moving on, you know, to leave the area because, you know, he, he was stressing her out. She just lost her husband like the year before or something like that. And he didn't want to be a burden to her, but he knew the danger, so he, he kept trying to convey without really saying. And, and it's something he regrets. He regrets not coming right out and telling her. Um, so the, all these background stresses are going on. He's still doing his thing. He he, got, he fixed whatever issue was done with the house and, and whatnot. And he hadn't originally planned on leaving until later on in the spring. Now, it was getting to the point where... Um, things were starting to warm up not melting but warm up you know as compared to 20 30 below depending on you know time of day so he goes out one morning and he was checking the oil drum and he was just banging it with a stick and then he goes up and he puts a dipstick in it to check the actual level because they were um he was going to run down and get another drum of fuel and pump it in and as he's testing it he's up on the drum and he notices off in the tree line the kids were just right around the corner of the house playing. He, he could see their shadows playing. And off in the tree line about 100 yards away, he notices a peaking movement like this. And at first it caught his eye because it was movement and nothing else was moving. It was a still winter day, crisp, clear winter day. And he sees this thing peaking, so he immediately, his heart sank. Because um, it, it, it looked to him that it was looking at the kids. And he he started feeling bad within himself, like he brought it back, you know, because he went out to the cave a few times. Didn't go up to it, but went to the area and was looking. And he felt that maybe he'd drawn it back by doing that. Maybe it was watching him from a different place he was unaware of as he was going around. But he always felt watched, he said, when he went out there. So immediately, he's off the drum. He dropped the dipstick in there. Um, it, Anyway, he, he dropped it in there and didn't even close the lid on it and got in the house and grabbed the gun. When he comes back out, <coughs> the kids were laughing and they were half the distance between where the house is and where that tree line is and they're laughing and they're kind of trotting that way and he calls them, hey, you know, get over here. You don't go running off in the trees. I said, no, my friend's laughing over there. And he goes, that's not your friend over there laughing. She goes, no, no, it's my friend whoever... I know her laugh. She's over there playing with her friends. I just know it. We're going to go and see them. He goes, no, no, you're not. You get your little butts in the house now. And they were like, you know, my mom said we can. Well, your mom's wrong. Get in the house. So they go in the house crying to mom. Mom gets pissed at him. Understandably, she didn't know the situation, you know, so, you know, no ill will towards her whatsoever. But he told her, hey, something's only mimicking the laughing over there that's not their friends i saw it it's not their friends it's a hairy man and she just pfft, whatever you know she goes we've been living here for years no one's even seen one you know that's just whatever you you, you know quit drinking and, and he wasn't a drinker you know and she, he's like no i'm sober look you don't have to accept it it's what's going on and i'm gonna go take care of it and she goes well you you don't need to be running around with the gun being paranoid. You know, you spent too much time wherever on, on some old family stuff she brought up and threw in his face. And, and, you know, there was a little bit of an argument. So during this time of the argument, 
a scream happens about sound like about a mile away and he suspected it was the same one saw him come out and took off and then got it with distance away and screamed and then she went what the hell was that and he goes i told you it wasn't their friends i'm going to go take a look and she immediately was like no 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 that's unnatural you don't don't go chasing after that and he goes now nah, you know he goes i already know it's it's it was watching the kids what what are you going to do when it snatches one of them you know then what 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 do we do then she had nothing to say about that and just took the kids inside and uh so he made a plan he went to one of the neighbors and asked them hey would you mind going on a, a quick snow machine ride with me i want to check some things out he he wasn't specific but he was like i may need someone to be there with me and the guy he asked was like no i ain't going out in this you know my snow machine needs repaired the tracks messed up or something along those lines so he goes okay well you know thanks anyway goes back over fuels up heads on out that trail now as he's going out that trail there's a bunch of little side trails that split off and go into you know different places one circles around this lagoon type of area and goes back up to more houses up river a little ways and you know some lead off to trapping cabins and what have you so he was kind of just weaving through looking for sign of what direction this thing was moving because he had started initially in the direction he heard the scream and as he's kind of weaving through all these little trails and stuff he had stopped periodically and turn off the snow machine and just listen look up in the trees and as he was doing this it, it was about oh five six miles away from his niece's house away from all the other structures and stuff he notices the first little valley there or in between the first little valley and the second one something something like that that he saw this thing going up the side of one and it if it crested that little mountain it would be on the side where the cave is on the opposite side of the other valley and so he goes okay it's moving fast i, I can maybe catch it before it gets into that cave he goes as fast as he can in that old sled and i've been on those old sleds they don't you're not winning any races, bro. Don't don't sign up for a drag race unless you soup that bitch up. So he, he hauls butt as fast as he can. And as he gets to that valley where this cave is, he, he hooks and stops. And he stops in snow and gets the snow machine stuck. So he has to jump off, and he's not worried about getting it unstuck at that moment. He runs a little further to clear the trees, and just as he does, he notices it in the open jetting across that valley. And so he takes his time, he catches his breath, and with the 7mm mag, he gets a bead on it and put a round in its back. Uh, the direction it was running was almost straight ahead of him, so he didn't have to lead it much. You know what I mean? It, it was basically a pretty clean, straight-on shot, no wind, no nothing. Crack, And he saw it kind of lurch forward and then run faster, and then it dropped down on all fours and went up into the trees going up towards that cave. So he said, shit, you know, so he slung the rifle, went over, got the snow machine unstuck, restarted it, got back onto the pack trail and ripped up to where he had made this little turnaround that was now packed. So he, he got there and he walked, he, he started walking up the hill. And as he's walking up the hill, he hears cracking through the timbers and a big rock comes cracking through and almost hit him. And so he's like, okay, it's up there. And he ducks around and he's, he's trying to go from tree to tree to get a get a bead up the hill at this thing and it seemed like every time he was getting to a spot where he would be able to see it another rock came banging through so he'd have to duck and then when he would get sight again it was gone and that kind of that kind of went on for he said almost two hours it, it was this back and forth the rock would be thrown and and he was focused uh, he had already shot it he knew that well he felt within himself that if he didn't finish the job this thing was going to be vengeful and come back and, and potentially hurt his niece or his, you know, her, her little ones. Now, he, he wasn't able to get a clear shot. It, it just, it went on and on and he knew it was getting dark and this thing would have the advantage because he just went with the rifle. He had no flashlight. There was a little light on the snow machine, but it, it was a joke. It ran on a magneto. It wasn't getting very bright, you know. So he he cut his losses. He knew what, you know, potentially it would follow him back. So he jumped on the snow machine, heads back as quick as he can. And when he gets there, um, his niece, uh, 
not understanding fully what was going on, uh, told him that tomorrow morning you need to leave. There's there's stuff going on that wasn't going on before you got here. You know you're, you know there's this crazy screaming. You said you saw the hairy man, and, and you know it it just you did your work. You know, and I thank you, but tomorrow I think it's best. Maybe you should leave. He goes, okay, well, understand, I saw the hairy man, and I shot it in its back, and I've been gone for hours now trying to finish that job so you're not in danger, and she just kind of was like, I, you're not going to use that as an excuse to have a, a place to flop, and he was like, I volunteered to come here to help you. It, it was a little little family thing, let's be honest, you know, she wasn't fully understanding, and he wasn't really giving enough, but when he did give enough, she just didn't seem to want to except what he was talking about and so he goes okay well give me two days to make my arrangements she said yeah that you know that's fine but let's just before it gets you know bad and we don't talk anymore let's just you know you can go on your way he agreed you know it, it kind of broke his heart but he he understood at the same time because it was a bad look i mean you know here your uncle shows up and within months you know there's crazy shit going on he's claiming he sees a hairy man i mean you know it would it would seem outlandish, you know? So, that night, he he was always sleeping out on the couch. Because it was just two rooms. A room for the kids and room for mom. And he didn't want to disturb that, you know? <clears throat> so, he hears, uh, in the middle of the night, he hears giggling. And and so, he stands up and he goes and, he, and he's listening. And, and the door for the kids' room was just a curtain hanging. You know, it was a remote village. There wasn't no, you know home and garden and they weren't in architects you you know architect digest or any shit like that it was a simple home you know very simple nothing nothing spectacular whatsoever and so he's listening at the curtain and he hears the youngest girl saying it keeps peeking in the window and then they would laugh again and say see see i saw it peeking in the window <sighs> like and so he he continues to listen and, and so he, he slips across the way to his niece's room and, and whispers in there, it's, it's peeking in the girl's room. And, and she was startled up and, like, was loud, like, what the hell are you talking, what? And he goes, Shh, you know, it's peeking in their window right now, listen. And then she, you know, it went quiet, and they listened, and the girls giggled again. See, it keeps, it keeps looking, it's right outside there. Mom hears that and goes, what the fuck? And she goes, what did you bring to my house? I, I, and I understand her view on it, but he told her, look, I didn't bring anything. It it showed up. I told you. You didn't believe me. I went and did thing. You didn't believe me. Here we are. And she goes, well, I, it still may not be that. He goes, it is. Now, they're talking in whispered tones, trying to half listen to the girls. And then he, they hear the the oldest girl go, oh, no, that that's so and so. Oh, she wants she wants us to come outside and play. Don't you hear her talking? And they got real. They were like really listening, and they could hear childlike talk, but nothing they could make out. So this thing was outside the fucking window, making mimicking another child in the area. Now, um, he said they couldn't make out English words, but there was tones that made it sound like a little girl. But in a language they couldn't even, it made no sense. It was like gibberish. And so immediately the mom was up in that room and um, getting the girls into her room. And he grabbed the gun and went outside. Now, when he went outside, they, they had antiquated flashlight technology back then. Um, those big six volts the, and the, the incandescent light on it was this very, it was a yellowish like beam real real kind of dirty light so to speak and it didn't it didn't put out and project much but it was all he had so he grabs a rifle and he's out there and just as you go out the door the kids' bedroom was immediately there to the left you know 15 feet maybe at and that's you know that's being generous so he goes out and he's ready and there was nothing there and so he kind of kind of turns back and forth and when he turns to his right he notices out of the right corner of his eye in his peripheral this thing ducked behind the corner on this side of the house so he goes okay 
So he goes, you know, he yells in the door, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna check their window, and I'll be back. And what he does is he goes down the little steps and goes towards the girls' room around the corner because he knew it was behind him over on that corner. He was trying to get it to come out and follow behind him, and it did. He gets around that corner, and he's standing, and he, uh, well, leaning back kind of on a knelt position with the rifle pointing up a little higher. And he saw there was an old, uh, kind of like a street light, uh, kind of light up on a post at the far end of the yard that kind of put some light into the area, but not much. But he could see the little bit of a shadow coming to peek around. As soon as it does, he just, as soon as he saw something dark come around the corner, he shot at it. Bam! Big scream. This thing, it shot blood on him onto the side of the house and it ran into the trees as he was he got jammed up trying to work the bolt action to get another round in and uh so it, it slipped into the trees and so immediately he once he clears it he starts tracking because it, it was it, it was blood was all over the snow and uh he said nothing to his niece he, he needed to stay focused on uh getting after it so he tromps through the trees and he's trying his best to fall because in the snow he could see the blood real bright in the snow in, in winter time in alaska it gets pitch black but if there's enough ambient light around it'll reflect off the snow and give the illusion of better night vision right and he was going on that and i i mean i would have too you know i why not why not make use of that natural light and, and do your thing so he, he's following the bloodstains and he notices it stops by some bigger trees so he figured okay it's up in the trees i've seen this game before so immediately he starts looking for dark movement in the trees and sure enough this one tree it was obviously not big enough to support this thing because it was slowly kind of doing this number and it started making a cracking sound <laughs> it, it collapsed down under the thing's weight it he saw it struggling to get up and he put another round he couldn't tell if it was facing him or facing away because it was just a very dimly lit silhouette and he was shooting for a dark mass so he hit it again let out a scream and it kind of started staggering and running through trees as he puts in another round now he had he has two rounds left one in the chamber one still in the in the little mag in the magwell and so he knew he had to finish this and he hoped there wasn't other ones he had only seen this one and so he was hoping it was just the one and he wasn't going to get you know fucked up on the way back but he he had he knew he had to finish this so as he's as he's cutting behind trees and, and watching this thing it's it's flopping it's standing up and it's staggering around and it finally stopped against a black uh, spruce tree and was leaning there and it looked like it was having labored breathing he said because it was kind of undulating back and forth like it was just trying to breathe but couldn't and as it was doing that he he aimed for what he thought would be the head and he did a little whistle like that and it kind of turned profile and when it turned profile he had a wider target and he squeezed and popped it right in the ear and it dropped went down hard um he, he said he immediately um, started crying. He had a flashback of what had happened before. And when I was asking him, I was like, man, what do you think, what do you think perpetuates this being Mark thing? You know, because I've been told that shit and I, I, don't, I don't care to indulge it any, but if there's a grain of truth to it, I, I want to know as much as I can before I'm out in those woods. And so he told me that, uh, it has to do with something about when you see one, when you shoot one, when, when there's any kind of close interaction, they know you. And it's a, a universal knowledge between them that once they know you're a bad guy to them, then other ones will know and they will sense that on you. He said it has to do with the fear they invoke in us it leaves a certain smell on us. And once they pick up that smell, the other ones in a different area they sense that smell that oh he's a bad guy to us type thing not i'm just going by what he said just purely what he said i i don't know that for sure um so as he goes over to the body sorry i i felt i needed to share that portion because it th those kind of things weigh heavy on me especially since i'm going to be going deep in the woods real soon so 
Uh, he gets up on it, and, and it's obviously dead. There's a, a mist of blood all over the snow from when he hit it in the ear. And he wasn't maybe 100, 150 yards from his niece's house into the tree line going away from the uh, Yukon River. He assesses the situation. He puts his last round into the rifle and kind of nudges it to make sure it wasn't playing possum. He knew it was dead, but he, you know, wanted to make doubly sure. So he makes sure, and he, he backtracks and gets to the house, and his, his niece is up smoking a cigarette on the couch, has the girls locked in her room under the bed, and she's going off. You know, she's going off. She she had a stash of some whiskey, and she was, she was drinking it to calm her nerves and, you know, cussing him out for bringing this thing around. And, um... Uh, it it really hurt him that he was unable to convey at that time he was doing it out of love he wasn't doing it to bring any trouble on her he was doing it as a form of protection but she she was you know obviously emotional and wasn't going to hear it um i I can't judge that you know she's going on limited knowledge and this shit's happening and her kids are in danger so I get it, you know, and, and so did Thomas. You know, he, he held no ill will. Um, he went back over the next day and went to go look for the body, found it. It was it was still right where it was. No other sign of another one coming to try to pull the body away. So he goes to the guy down a ways and asks him, Hey, I need your help um, getting rid of something. Uh but I don't want you to freak out. The guy goes, I don't even want to know. I can help you with whatever you may need, but I don't want to know, and I don't want to go. He goes, okay, well, I, I need a, I need some rope, and uh, the use of, you know, your, you know, whatever kind of uh, condition your snow machine's in, maybe it's stronger than, you know, the one my niece has. And he goes, the track's still messed up, nothing I could do to help you so he goes okay well I appreciate the use of the rope and the guy goes keep the rope I don't want to know nothing shut the door so he takes a small spool of rope he goes back across the way makes it back up to his niece's house gets out the chainsaw hooks up the sled to the little snow machine and went out there and it was partially frozen and rigor mortis but he, he hacked it up into pieces that could easily more easily be moved, threw it in the sled. Uh, he started with the legs, ran way off, back up to where the cave was, threw the legs into the cave opening, went back. Went back, hacked off the arms and the head, went right back to the cave and threw them in the cave. Came back, really struggled to get the torso into the sled because uh, there was so much mass and weight to it he said that the torso alone felt like it was at least 500 pounds without the legs arms and head he said that's what it felt like it may not have been as much but it's what it felt like and so um god the stomach he has to just but i mean you know it's no different than quartering up a moose i guess once you get past you know that a fucking hairy man there you know once you get past that part i guess it's it's just all downhill but uh so he gets it loaded and he knew he wasn't gonna be able to drag this fucking torso all the way up to that cave it just he just wasn't built that way you know he wasn't strong enough and didn't have you know a pulley or come along or nothing so he gets into that valley and cuts way to the back of it and just as he's almost getting stuck he circles around a couple times to pack the trail stops and just tips the sled over and lets the torso roll out rights the sled ripped on out of there um he said he went back to that cave in uh the mid 80s to check it out his, his niece um unfortunately succumbed to uh, a self-inflicted wound we'll, we'll just put it that way and the kids were taken by the state um he, he was really broken up about that, um, still is. Uh, he was crying about it this morning. I'm trying not to dwell on it too much because it makes me want to cry. Um, 
because of sorrow in his voice. He was... He, he sacrificed his relationship. He knew, knowingly sacrificed his relationship with his niece to protect his niece. But she, she didn't see that, at least to his knowledge, before she uh, passed away of a, a self-inflicted injury. Um, so that's where he wanted me to convey to you guys, um, love your people. Explain to them why you're upset. Don't, don't hold it in get it out don't don't end up like he did with a lot of regrets with loved ones that he did not make amends with you know before their passing and um yeah uh thomas i thank you for sharing um if i missed anything brother just you know call me uh, i don't think i did um and and that, that that's into that. But um, thanks for joining me today. Uh, I'll have a video out probably later on today to discuss some background things um, that have been going on, and give some thanks to people that have been working really hard behind the scenes. And it'll all make sense uh, as soon as I explain it next time I have a chance. All right, thanks for joining me.